finger at Project mm -hmm. Notes. So this cross fingering is still mm -hmm. present in some, this is, was published in South Germany in the yeah. 17th century. And it's very interesting mm -hmm. because he uh, offered the same idea of the um, Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it continues all the way to the end. And it exists side by side with uh, other sources coming even from the same region that are based upon the third finger. For instance, Lorenzo Pena uh, writing in the 1670s, or Anne Manchieri, even earlier. You know. So I, um, maybe we should just take a short time out um, because of what you were saying about about the elbow, because I think it's possible to, to do this in a way that, that you don't lose so much control here. And, and this is a kind of homage to uh, Joel Spearster, who would, would have done this with you if he had been there this, here, this year. Um, and it has to do with, with hand position. Uh, so let's all take our hands and imagine that you are carrying firewood. Somebody has just given you a firewood, okay? Now, from that, you go into playing position. So let's, oh yes. So everybody is, is taking their hands from this position and you go to playing position like this. Do you notice a certain amount of tension in here? Mm -hmm. This is because you have put your elbow down, <laughs> right? And this is up here and now you're turning and so this is twisting your arm. This is a recipe for tension. So instead of going to playing position this way, go into playing position by keeping this a constant. So now this means we have to move the whole arm. So it's going from here to here. And of course, the first thing that happens is that your elbows come out maybe a little bit but you, you can adjust this. But do you notice the difference in relaxation between this, if you twist, and if you don't twist and just do it so, okay? So this allows you to maintain that connection. So if you are turning, if you really want to do that, you, if you keep this plane, constant, then you can continue to, to have the connection and control from, from here. What won't work is if you do this. I can all, already feel it just hurts <laughs> in there to do that, but you have to instead get the whole arm to, to have this constant in a plane, so you don't want to twist it. And uh, I often have advised my students when they begin to practice a practice session that you begin uh, by starting with the, uh, the wood carrying position and then go in, we call it the, the rowing of the boat position mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as being more comfortable for, for this. And that helps you to avoid that kind of, of uh, tension. Okay, so <clears throat> onward. <laughs> so let's, let's go back to, to measure 13. And, and so it means here that you just have to be a little bit more intentional about releasing the third finger as you go. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> it's starting to sound to me like ya da 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 That's coming very, very strong. And it's, it's also a half note at the end of the measure. Yeah. So, and it happens at the same time that something is happening in the lower part underneath it. So you can release those half notes much sooner. And, and maybe any one of those possibilities would be okay, but they were three 
distinctly different possibilities. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and <laughs> so my question is, where is the release mechanism coming from? What part of your body is controlling the release of, of that note? Okay, so or, or you're, you're oh, okay, well try that, try that, so, the, so that uh, it's, it's the equivalent of what you were doing yesterday with the whole leg motion, right? I came upstairs into the class just as everybody was doing this, <laughs> and I thought, it's like teaching horses to count. <laughs> But the equivalent <laughs> it comes from from there. Yeah, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this was this was raising, and nothing was happening on the key, yeah. because your wrist was doing this, uh -huh. right? Yeah, and so. Yeah, so there was this elegant motion doing this, and, and, but nothing was happening to the sound. And so, <laughs> when I, I, for, for years, happy years, I taught at New England Conservatory together with Yuko Hayashi, and her favorite, her favorite expression in teaching was, must conserve energy. <laughs> must conserve energy. So she was very good about noticing any kind of energy, exp exp expending of energy that didn't have a musical result. And, and so, if you, if you let, your, let your wrist be actually quiet there, you get, you get more effect with less energy. <laughs> So you seem to be adjusting to make it just a little bit later in the release. Mm. Because you don't have to start the motion so early if, as soon as you start the motion, something happens. <laughs> it's only when nothing happens that we <laughs> somehow feel like we have to start this motion early. Uh, it's almost like driving a 1965 Chevrolet when you are turning the wheel and nothing happens until about 10 seconds later and then the car is here. <laughs> yeah, good. Okay, so can we go on with the with little imitative things? Yes, we talked about the syncopation. Here, okay, here's a good way to remember about the syncopation. Leave it out for a moment. So instead of playing the syncopation, play just the lower two parts. So if you hear... Now we can hear what's really going on with the, with the rhythmic structure. And, and so you don't want to do anything to mess that up mm. because -da -de -da -de -da -dum -dum, that's what we're about to hear. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, did, what did you do? Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, we don't have to, to fudge it by doing a different release for the soprano as for as for the alto. <laughs> so this is this is very interesting because when you think about what are the implications of a fingering approach in which much is done by means of interval fingering and position fingering. It suggests to me that that the sort of starting point for release is that you release together vertically. And so the idea of polyphonic articulation in which one voice has a radically different articulation from another voice, 
this, I really think, is coming out of a later kind of consciousness, a uh, much later kind of consciousness, having to do with 20th century thinking about the relationship between articulation and melodic shape. And so what, one of the things that the, it's, it's not that the, the sources are shouting it at you, it's just there for us to see if we look at, at the fingering information, if we look at the articulation information coming from diminution treatises and so on, and we look at in, information about bowing on string instruments, what it's all saying is that the speech of music is primarily, first of all, before it's anything else, organized around the heartbeat, the pulse of, of the music, or we would say the meter uh, of, of the music. And therefore, uh, the idea of, of polyphonic articulations, this is somehow a secondary consideration that comes way, way down the road <laughs> later on. So, oh. <laughs> now, we want to make that not so strong. Lead in, it's easier for you to. This measure where we just stopped, we had a very nice right hand, but in order to get the suspension, the way the left hand comes to the suspended moment, <laughs> the, the, see the left hand is, we're suspending there. The way you approach the A is part of what uh, causes us to hear this effect and the dissonance. Okay, so she did it two ways at once. <laughs> and the first way she did it was through the consonant, the articulation. She made a little ta which we do anyway, okay, because of where the note is. We do that anyway. The other thing she did was to, to make a long eighth note. And so I think we only need one of those. And it's, it's easy for us to, uh, to spread out our expressivity too much so that we are using everything in our vocabulary at any, any one moment to get a particular effect, when maybe it's only necessary to use one thing uh, in our vocabulary. In this case, maybe just the, the little speech. Starting at measure 39, we have here, ladies and gentlemen, a perfect example of image of fantasia. And so this is a very nice way to get from the completion of the series of entries starting at bar 32, soprano, bar 33, alto, bar 36, tenor, and then soprano at 38, Everybody is home, everybody is there. So we now gradually move to cadence. And the, the standard technique, whether it's in Scheidemann or uh, somebody else, we heard it just a, a few minutes ago, uh, the movement towards cadence is often activated by some kind of sequential motion. And this continues to be the case well into the 18th century. And you, when you think of how concertos are <laughs> arranged, 
uh, and what drives them to the cadence. But what is the material uh, for an 18th century uh, sequential motion? It might be a movement through the circle of fifths, harmonic motion. Here we have at bar 39 in the soprano, having the structure. So this is a classic Fantasia image. So in this toccata, we have Fantasia. And remember that the Fantasia here is a concept before it's a genre, it's a concept. And it remains a concept regardless of, of genre. And whenever we have this pattern of descending fourths, we can combine it canonically so it works as a canon at the octave. It works also as a canon at the lower sixth. But if we transposed it up, if we reverse the voices, then it works. Canon of the upper seventh. So this can be combined in many different ways. If you, if you start with the canon of the octave and just add a, a third voice in parallel thirds and then take away your first voice, then you will discover what the different possibilities are for, for canonic treatment. And so a musician learning, as Scheidemann did under Sveling, no doubt would be learning all of these things in the hand. Uh, so that at any moment, uh, when, you were, when you have something like bar 38, oh, perfect. And there are different ways he could have realized this. He could have done it. Or it could have been or because the third voice can follow either one of the other voices in parallel thirds or it can just descend by step in longer notes as, as you did at the, the end. So, so now you see how it's also a very nice cantus firmus technique. And the, um, the trick is, the trick is to make a position in three voices where the fifth is the cantus firmus. note later otherwise you get parallel fifths. <laughs> yep. Okay. So I think that pretty much covers everything I wanted to say here. I'm I'm pleased with the way you are making quick progress with this. So uh, it's just a question of listening uh, to the effect in the fast passages with the with the paired notes and and when you hear it becoming too slurred 
just you give attention to the release of every finger. Actually, you try to make it a little bit more even in the release. And it will never be completely even because uh, the second, whatever the second finger is, whether it's four going up or two coming down, will always release a little bit more quickly, which is good. That's what we want uh, to, to be the case. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Well done.